Our scripture today is from the book of Jude, verses 14 through 19. Will you stand with me as I read? Verses 14 through 19 of Jude. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, that is the apostates we've been studying about, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and on all the harsh things and ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. So word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for your grace that allows us to have this time to come together, to lift up our voices in song and praise to you and to study your word together as we come together to worship you corporately, Father. We just thank you so much for this book that you've given to us, and we just pray that as we study once more, we'll allow the Holy Spirit to once more have control uh, of our thoughts, of our minds, and and help us to focus upon the things of your word as we are gathered here this morning so that uh, we will take this warning seriously to heart as we leave this place. Father, it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I'm sure most of you are familiar with W.C. Fields. He lived from 1880 to 1946. Was an American comedian, actor, writer, uh, always quick with a witty quip and could make audiences roar with laughter. What you may or may not know is that Fields was an avowed atheist. Religion was not a part of his life. However, late in his life, when faced with the reality of his death, the story is told that a friend came to visit Fields and found him sitting and reading the Bible. When asked about this newfound interest in Scripture, Fields quipped, I'm just looking for loopholes, my friend. Looking for loopholes. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 affirms that it's appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. While Fields may not have understood much about the judgment day, evidently he was concerned enough to know that he would have to stand before God and give an answer for his life. A few years ago, a survey indicated that four out of every five Americans agree that we will all stand before God at a time of judgment and answer for our lives. Four out of every five Americans. However, I seriously doubt that four out of every five Americans agree on what that means or how it will occur, or to what God they will have to answer to, or uh, shall I say, to what person of the Godhead they will have to answer to, or what it will take to pass the test and enter into eternal bliss. But make no mistake about it, judgment is coming. Jude gives a final warning in our passage today that there is a day of reckoning on the horizon, especially for the apostates that we've been studying about. Jude warns the apostate that Jesus is, in fact, coming back. And when he returns, he will bring judgment and justice. That's not a warning of uh, impending, not just a warning of impending wrath, but um, hopefully it's a call to repentance as well, uh, to take the escape route that's been provided from that wrath. These apostates who continue in their rebellion will face severe consequences. The apostate and everyone else for that matter needs to know that the Savior is coming back and that every one of us will indeed answer to him. Let's look at verse 14 again. 
Jude says, Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, the apostates, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Jude references the second coming of Jesus Christ here. Unlike the first time when the Lord Jesus Christ came in humility, this will be a time when Jesus comes back that he will come back in flaming fury with judgment. And there will be judgment for the apostate. The day of the Lord will be a time of devastation. The day of the Lord will be a time of wrath, of judgment, of condemnation. Uh, many Old Testament prophecies, prophets spoke about this. Joel, Amos, Zechariah, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Zephaniah. Those are just a few that spoke about the prophesied return of Jesus Christ and uh, the judgment that he would bring. Jesus discussed his return in great detail in the Olivet Discourse, as recorded in Matthew chapter 25. Paul also covered the second coming of Christ in several of his epistles. John saw it through Christ's revelation to him, given to him on the Isle of Patmos that we now have in our Bible as the book of Revelation. And in our text today, Jude warns of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, foretold as far back as Enoch. Enoch, like all the other Old Testament prophets, though, had no vision or information regarding the church age in which we live today, the church, the body of Christ. Um, therefore, he doesn't mention it. He ignores the rapture of the church because, again, he knew nothing of that, neither did any of the Old Testament Prophets. It's not a subject of Old Testament prophecy. But with the full light of the New Testament revelation in our hands today, we know that when the Lord returns to earth in judgment, the church today, the body of Christ, will not be here. We will have already been raptured out. This age of the church, the body of Christ, will have ended. It will have closed. It will end with the rapture of the church, as the Apostle Paul spoke about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. In chapter 5 where, is where the Apostle Paul goes into the second coming of Jesus Christ in judgment. But in chapter 4, he makes it clear that we will already be gone. We don't know when this church age will end. And even when it does, no one will know the time of the Lord's return in judgment. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, But of that day and that hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Many will not be prepared for the return of the Lord. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3, when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This speaks of the suddenness of the event when the Lord returns in wrath and judgment. What seems to be a time of peace and safety for those who will still remain here on the earth will quickly become a time of devastation and catastrophe when the Lord's wrath begins to be poured out. For those who are present at that time, the Scriptures make it clear that there will be no escape for any of them. That day, you see, will be sudden and the consequences will be severe. The day of the Lord is not just the day in which He returns, but it's the time leading up to His return as well, which we know is the time of the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. That day of the Lord will be the beginning of the pouring out of His wrath that culminates in His return. This will be a time of inescapable judgment and wrath, poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. Remember that Jude said one of the attributes of the apostates is that they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He had said that back in verse 4. When Jesus comes back, He will appear this time in unveiled glory, the fullness of His glory being revealed. 
And on that day, there will be no doubt as to who he is. He will come in great power, and no power on earth will be able to oppose him. More on that in a moment. But Jude warns the apostate that the Savior is coming. And he goes on to say that when he comes, he is not coming alone, but that the saints are coming with him. Did you catch that in the verse, in verse 14? At the end it says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. If you're following along in the NIV this morning, I believe it says ten thousands of his holy ones. When Jesus returns at the second coming, he will return with holy ones. The term ten thousands here is not a literal number, by the way. It's just a Greek expression to describe an innumerable multitude that will accompany him in his return. The King James and the New King James says here that he will return with his saints. As I stated, the NIV says he will return with his holy ones. And therefore, some other versions render the phrase as his angels. He will return with his angels. So which is it then? When the Lord returns in a second coming to establish the kingdom on earth, will he return with saints or will he return with angels? Well, folks, it's not either or. It's both. He will return with saints and angels. And the balance of Scripture makes that clear. What's not clear is whether the saints who return to rule and reign with Christ in the messianic millennial kingdom includes us in the church, the body of Christ. I'm going to tell you that I do not believe that it does. I do not teach that we will return to rule and reign with Christ in the earthly realm. I believe that we will rule and reign with Christ in the heavenly realm. At the start of Scripture, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And all throughout the Old Testament, you learn about God's plan for the earth. And in the New Testament, it continues as well in the teaching of Christ establishing His kingdom. And it culminates in the book of Revelation as it's talked about God's plan being fulfilled in the earth as first His wrath is poured out and then that kingdom is established in the earth. But I don't believe that we have anything to do with the kingdom that was promised for the nation of Israel. I believe that we will rule and reign with Christ in the heavenlies, in the heavenly realm. You'll recall that when Satan rebelled against God, a third of the angelic hosts followed him in that rebellion. And in the middle of the tribulation period, as it's recorded in Revelation chapter 12, Satan and the fallen angels will be kicked out of the heavenly realm. I believe it's the place of the church, the body of Christ, to fulfill those new vacancies in glory in the heavenly realm. But that's just the way I believe it and teach it. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ will be accompanied by redeemed saints when he returns in power and glory. But I believe it's the redeemed saints of the kingdom program, not the mystery program of the church, the body of Christ. And the apostates, those wicked deceivers who denied the Lord, they will pay a great price when he returns. Now that we've seen that the Lord is coming back and he's bringing saints with him, let us consider what else the Lord will bring with him when he comes. First of all, he will bring judgment. Look at verse 15. He will come, you see, verse 15, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The first time Jesus came, his purpose when he came, was to bring the means of salvation to a lost world, to a lost race, the descendants of Adam. When he comes the second time, he will not come in humility. He will come in glory and power to bring judgment. He will pour out his undiluted wrath upon those who do not obey the gospel. Let's look at a few passages. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. Just forward a few pages from where we are. Revelation chapter 14. It's 
Starting with verse 14. John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him, who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust the sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Jesus will reap the harvest of the earth with a sharp sickle, and the angelic hosts with him, thrusting in their sharp sickle. But what is this sickle spoken of? What is this weapon that's used here to reap the harvest of the earth. Have you ever thought about it before? Have you ever considered it? In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says the word of God is quick and powerful and what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. I believe it is with his word that the Lord Jesus Christ will defeat all of his enemies. And do not believe he needs literal weapons. Only the breath of his mouth. Only the word that he speaks. Only the word that we already have. And this is in keeping with Old Testament prophecy as well as the balance of the record in the book of Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, starting with verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and who, who, he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a, white, uh, clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word, the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Out of his mouth proceeds a sharp sword. Again, I believe that is the word of God. The word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11. Speaking of this rod of Jesse who would come to rule and reign, we're just going to read the first four verses here. Isaiah 11, starting with verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Again, again of course, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, his delight is the fear of the Lord, the fear of Jehovah, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Now look at this, verse 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equality for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Those ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, it says in the King James, or into lewdness in the New King James, as Jude had said in verse 4, will one day face a terrible judgment from the Lord Jesus Christ. They will find that this Jesus that they used for financial gain, for personal profit, 
was indeed who he said he was. They will bow before him, the one whom they denied, and they will humbly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But guess what? Sadly, for them, it will be too late. They will face eternal destruction as a result of the rebellious life they live here in this earthly journey. Jesus will bring judgment when he comes. And not only will he bring judgment, he will also bring justice. The first time the Lord came, he offered mercy and grace. In fact, he still offers men and women today in the church, the body of Christ, the same thing. Mercy and grace. But when he returns in judgment, it will bring justice that he brings. What do all those terms mean? Grace. What is grace? Grace is when you receive something that you don't deserve. When we talk about God's salvation offered to us, it's strictly, solely out of His grace because we could never deserve salvation. We could never earn it in any way. So it's God's grace that saves us. Mercy, you see, is when we don't receive what we do, in fact, deserve. What we deserve as those who have rebelled against God, is eternal punishment from God. That's what we deserve. But out of God's mercy, He does not give us what we deserve. He withholds from us the punishment and judgment that we deserve, you see, because of His mercy. And then out of His grace, He even then goes further and gives us something that we don't deserve eternal life with Him. So justice, you see, is when you receive exactly what you deserve. When the Lord returns, the time of mercy and grace will be ended, and it will be a time of judgment. At His return, the Lord Jesus Christ will convict the apostate of all of their ungodly deeds that they have done, they will be confronted with undeniable evidence of their actions which were ungodly and they will receive exactly what they deserve. And not just the apostate, but all who have denied Jesus Christ. Notice in this verse how many times the word ungodly is used. Four times in this verse. What does it mean exactly? Does it mean that if you go out and commit murder, that's an ungodly act? It is. I mean, we, when we do something against God's will, that certainly is an ungodly deed. That's an ungodly act. But listen, folks, it's not just the overt sinfulness that's ungodly. Ungodly just means with the absence of God. There are many people today who look like good, quote, quote, air quotes, who look like good people, but God is not a part of their life. And though they may look for all outward appearances to be like a good person, they are without God and therefore they are ungodly. That's the basis of it, you see. It's the absence of God. The term ungodly reveals the heart of the problem, especially concerning these apostates who's the subject here, foremost and forefront. They may put on a good show for the world to see, but they do not know God. They use the church and the Bible for their own personal gain. They cause irreparable damage and deceive many, but one day they will pay for their ungodly ways. Jesus Christ is coming back, and He is bringing with Him judgment and justice when He comes. 
Again, this warning from Jude is a call to repentance. Yes, judgment is coming, but it doesn't have to fall on you. Please heed the warning. Please listen. Please pay attention. Please accept the gift of salvation, the path of escape from the judgment that's coming through Jesus Christ, the one who shed his blood on our behalf for our sin. Please listen to the warning. Please change your chosen course of action. That's really the point of the warning. In England in 1881, foul weather had detained the fishermen in the harbor for over a full week. And then one day the sun came out. The sun began to shine, the clouds went away, the sky was a clear blue. It seemed like the storm had passed, but the harbor master insisted that it was only a break in the tempest. And he begged the captains not to leave the harbor. But guess what? 41 boats disregarded his warning and left the harbor. After all, there was no sign of a storm. So they ignored the warning of the danger. Just a few short hours later, the storm swept down on the coast and very few of those fishermen returned to the harbor. Nearly all of them were lost at sea because of the dreadful tempest that swept down on them. Those men were ushered into eternity because they did not heed the warning. Jude lifts up the storm signal now. He sends the warning that judgment is coming. You know, that warning isn't just for the apostate, as I said. The Bible warns all people, saved and lost, that judgment is coming, that that day is getting closer and closer. And the evidence is all around us, folks. And even so, many people still continue to reject God, Jesus Christ, and the Word of God. And when Jesus Christ returns in power and glory, it will be too late as I said. He will be coming with his saints to execute judgment upon all. I urge you, if you haven't done so already, to surrender to him while there is still time. There is a warning of judgment from the apostles. It's a warning from Jude to us. He gives us the information that's necessary for us to earnestly contend for the faith. Let's examine a few more things about this warning. We're going to skip verse 16 for the moment. I'm going to come back to it shortly. But in verses 17 and 18, we find that the warning of judgment is a prophetic warning. Look at those verses again, 17 and 18 of Jude. It says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, scoffers, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. This is not a message that originated with Jude. He calls to our remembrance that uh, the apostles of Jesus Christ had also given this warning. Of course, that mirrors the warnings given in this epistle from Jude, but he says again he's not the first. The apostles gave that warning. Turn back a few pages to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Starting with verse 1, Peter also confronted this problem of false teachers, of apostates. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 1, he says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Scoffers will come walking after their own lusts. It's the same thing that Jude just said, isn't it? Like Jude, Peter references the message of the apostles. They were the men who were chosen, who were called by the Lord Jesus Christ, who were commissioned 
to be his ambassadors. They were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. The message of God was placed in their mouth by the Holy Spirit of God, and God used these men to pen the New Testament. Now think about this. In the New Testament, there are 260 chapters contained. Of those, there are approximately 300 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the judgment that will follow. That's more on average than one reference per chapter of the New Testament. Listen to some of these references concerning the end times. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of him. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and all the works that are in it will be burned up. James chapter 5 and verse 7, he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Of course, he's referencing the second coming of the Lord. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Again, as I referenced earlier, it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where Paul talks about the second coming of the Lord and the judgment that he will bring with him. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul makes it clear we're already gone. We are not the children of wrath made for judgment. We are the children of God. We will be raptured out before that judgment comes. It is abundantly clear that the apostles, all the writers of the New Testament, believed in the return of Jesus Christ. Peter said there in 2 Peter chapter 3 that these scoffers deny the reality of the coming of Christ. They state that nothing has changed. All things have been the same since the beginning. Peter exposed the false teachers who ridiculed the teaching concerning Christ's return. The scoffers that Jude and Peter both spoke of had hardened their hearts against God. They don't believe that uh, in anything that they can't see with their own physical eyes. Not only do they not believe the prophecy, the problem is they also mock those who do, you see. Scoffers, mockers, saying, where is the promise of His coming? We hear that same argument today by skeptics, don't we? They will say people have been looking for Jesus to come back for 2,000 years now. And he hasn't arrived yet. Doesn't mean he's not coming. It means he is incredibly patient and merciful and gracious. Because again, I say, when he returns, it will be in judgment. He, in his grace and mercy and love, is delaying that judgment. They laugh, they mock, they scorn, they blaspheme, but Jude says, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. On that day, the skeptics and scoffers will realize that they were wrong and they will come to the realization that it is too late because, as Jude said, when he returns, it will be to execute judgment upon all. The judgment that is coming is a prophetic warning and it's also a prevalent warning. Christ's return for the church is imminent. The rapture spoken of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 could happen at any time. But as I said earlier, once that occurs, the wrath of God will begin to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Which means that we have a lot of work to do and a very limited amount of time to do it as the children of God, as the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. The apostates have infiltrated the church. They're doing all they can to destroy it, even now, right now, in the present. And sadly, many true believers are just sitting back and allowing it to happen without saying a single thing about it. Hence Jude's challenge to contend for the faith, to earnestly fight for the faith. When? Now. Right now. 
it's estimated that there are 1,845 references in the Old Testament to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 17 of the Old Testament books give the subject of the, of the return of Jesus Christ prominence. Out of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, again, 318 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are about one out of every 30 verses of the New Testament that reference Christ's return. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to the return of Jesus Christ. For every prophecy in the Bible about the first coming of Jesus Christ, there are eight concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks. Without a doubt, Jesus Christ is coming back because God's Word tells us time and time and time again that He will return. It's a prophetic warning, it's a prevalent warning, and it's a practical warning. In the last few verses of our text today, Jude paints a clear picture of the apostate. He describes certain attributes that define who these apostates are that we can use to identify them. The warning is important because it tells us what they do. Let's read verses 16 through 19 again. What do they do? They are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, having not the Spirit. The apostates are grumblers, complainers, they live to satisfy their own fleshly desires. They pridefully brag about themselves. They flatter others only to get what they want. They're scoffers. They're mockers. Earlier in this letter, we were told that they turn the grace of God into lewdness, that they deny the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. They are described as filthy dreamers who defile the flesh, who reject authority, who speak evil of dignitaries. Verse 10 says that they are like brute beasts who corrupt themselves. And add to all of that, verse 19, that says they create division in the church. These are the kinds of people to watch out for, Jude says. These are the people that we must take a stand against. We must stand up for our Savior. We must stand up and defend the truth of the gospel. We must contend for the faith. This is the heart of the purpose of Jude's letter. This is what he was constrained to write to us. Not only are we told what these apostates do, but we are told why they do it. Look at verse 19 one more time. These are sensual persons who cause divisions. Why? Having not the Spirit. The end of verse 19, you see, that's the heart of the problem of apostasy. The apostate does what he does because he is lost. They do not have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. Therefore, all they can do is simply follow their own natural instincts. And if they continue to deny the Lord Jesus and continue to reject the truth of God's Word, they will perish eternally. And if you've never been saved, you will face the same fate as the apostate. The Bible distinguishes between three groups of people. First of all, there's the spiritual person. Today, that's the person who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Second, there's the carnal person. The person living in the flesh. You see, this is a person who has been saved, but is not living the Christian life. Rather than living under the power of victory over the sinful flesh, the power of the old sin nature that we have, they are backslidden, they are carnal, you see. Saved, but living under the power of their flesh. 
The third person is the natural person. That's the person who is not saved. This is the person who is not indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And again, they may seem like a good person, but with the absence of God in their life, they are ungodly. Not having the Holy Spirit of God, they are not saved. And that's the final point that Jude wants us to know about the apostate. Regardless of how they may appear externally, if they are absent of the Holy Spirit, they are ungodly. And that's the root of the problem. The apostate is a natural person. However, it's quite possible that they are worse off than the average ordinary unbeliever. Because you see, the average ordinary unbeliever may be somebody who's never heard the gospel or maybe had heard something about it but didn't really understand. There is still hope for them to hear the gospel explained and to understand it. There's still hope for them that the Holy Spirit can still use His Word to bring about a change in their heart. The apostate, by contrast, has heard the gospel. The apostate is somebody who has studied it and does understand it and still rejects it, mocks it, and mocks you for believing it. Be careful, folks, because when you turn from God and you reject Him, then each time you do, it becomes easier and easier to continue to reject Him. And unfortunately, for most apostates, that's where they have found themselves now. And their heart is so hardened, and they've rejected God so many times, that for many, they're now beyond hope. So for you, I warn you, please listen to God. Please have a pliable heart. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's judgment coming, but you can't escape it. The judgment prepared for the apostate does not have to be the judgment that also awaits you. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today, right now, this moment, before you leave this building. Understand that there is nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. The only way anyone will ever get there is because they accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for their sins. And the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is proof that God is satisfied 100% with the price that Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. If God weren't satisfied, Jesus Christ would still be in that grave. But He's not. That tomb is empty, folks. Please believe it. Please accept the gift of salvation that God is offering through Jesus Christ. And know that once you do, your eternal life begins at that moment. Not something you'll receive someday. Something for those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ, it has already begun. Your eternal life has already begun. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, do it now. And your eternal life begins today. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this book that you've given to us. And even though there are passages that as we read it, it becomes depressing for us because of what it says will happen to those who not believe, do not believe. We understand, Father, that it's really out of your love that you confront us with those passages that we find so depressing, because it is your will that all come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. We thank you, Father, for your great love that provided such a way of salvation, for your grace and mercy that continues to hold off your judgment and justice, even at this present time. May we understand, Father, that we do have work to do and a limited time to do it, that we are your called ambassadors on behalf of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to urge men to accept the salvation that you are offering. 
May we strive, Father, to allow the Holy Spirit to have control in every aspect of every day of our life so that people will see you working through us, so that we will have an opportunity, even in the smallest degree, to give you the glory for all that you have done in our life and to present to those around us the message of the gospel, the message of your love. Father, it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer. Amen.